As 71 pass by, 72 set high, all oh, the charts you will see as you travel through me will all your expectations defy. It was 1972 and as the river of mud rolled through the sleepy little town, a torrent of gold flowed from the radio. Let's check out the hits that rang in the new year on January 7th, 1972. And at number 10 it's local boy John Blanchfield with Lucy's Place. Blanchfield seems to be forgotten a bit by history, but he's an interesting guy. He was besties with Mo Gibb back in the BG's Brisbaneian days and was accordingly given a few of the boys' songs to record. He was, in fact, the first act to record New York Mining Disaster 1941, the BG's first big international hit. He later got a supply of songs from Brian Cadd, who was at the time our premier local songwriter. Cadd was, and still is when I last saw him in 1922, an irrepressible and perpetually mischievous showman. Kind of like the uncle everyone loves who comes around on Christmas Day, has a little too much to drink, gooses the uptight next door neighbour but she forgives him when he gives her a saucy wink. Lucy's Place, another Cad song, is a two-fisted rocker and is like a few songs on this week's chart. While it doesn't exactly pull up any trees as a great record, it is the kind of song you could hear on the radio, nod your head or tap your foot along to. It doesn't outstay its welcome, it's pleasant but not especially memorable. It didn't do much business beyond its two weeks at number 10 and I can't really find much on what became of Blanchfield after Lucy's Place. It was his final single coming after a two year gap in releases. Who knows, he may be living just down the street for me as I write this. If you're out there John, give us a wave. Nine is another of those here at once, don't hate it, never remember it hits, from an act even more obscure than John Blanchfield. Looking at the third window by an American band called Horizon. It's sort of lightweight bubblegum with a naughty melody, but the lyrics are really creepy. I mean, really creepy. It's like every breath you take, crossed with rear window, crossed with Delilah, crossed with a strange smell coming from the guy's basement. Number eight is yet another, and perhaps the best of the songs this week, that aren't remembered as classics, but really aren't that bad. Happy Birthday Ruthie Baby by McGuinness Flint. Yet another band it's hard to find much resource material on. But Happy Birthday is a solid little bop, and after listening to it on Spotify, I didn't immediately move to stop the playlist. I kept listening, and this is a useful little band. Molten Barley Blues was another one of those songs that sparked instant recall when I heard it. Graham Lyle, one of the authors of this song, later went on to have a hand in writing What's Love Got To Do With It for Tina Turner. At seven is the not necessarily objectionable but kind of redundant My Boy by the latterly beloved franchise actor Richard Harris. Most famous for his highly divisive version of MacArthur Park, this was a good sized hit for Harris maxing out at four. Harris's singing career dwindled after this but he went on to, but he went on to further an already impressive body of work in movies, television and the stage for the next ten years, continuing to raise hell in the company of his good buddy Peter O'Toole. Rod Stewart is, to the pop fan, a real enigma. There have been few artists in my experience who have so wide a gulf between the magnificence of their best work and the squalor of their worst. Stewart presented in the early 70s as a different cut of vocalist, a man of tastefully and impeccably curated influences who filtered them through a singing that was as much a projection of a vivid personality as it was technique. And there are a few better examples of this than Maggie May, if not his biggest hit on these shores and possibly his best remembered, although the ironic cachet of Do You Think I'm Sexy has probably seen it surpass that in fame. Maggie May was the kind of a shaggy dog story that Stewart's songwriting serves well. The title track of the album from which Maggie May is taken, Every Picture Tells a Story, is a great example. And it's still a staple of what is left of oldies radio these days, and no doubt it's still trotted out somewhere near the end of Sir Rodney's sets to this very day. It's time now for the segment which is so popular with the young folks that it's been known to cause riots in Honduras and Guatemala. Hello and goodbye, in which we salute the fallen and greet the debutantes in this week's top 10. And there's only one record in this week, and that's Day by Day by Colleen Hewitt, up a great big 14 places to, spoiler alert, 
Number four, it replaces Johnny Rivers' Think His Name, which sounds like his great hit Mountain of Love rewritten with a new set of fashionable Jesus-y lyrics. I'm sure Jesus appreciated the shout out and all, but my word, it's a dull song. To give some credit, the album this is from does have a really good version of Jackson Brown's Rock Me on the Water. Not as good as Linda Ronstadt's, but it's pretty good anyway. The next number one is, in fact, Day by Day, which dethrones the current incumbent the week after next for a solitary week before the song this week at number 33 knocks it off. Now, let's look at the songs this week never made the top ten, and boy howdy are there some bangers this week. First up, New Zealand band The Lardy Dars, that's one of my favourite band names ever right there, with their great guitarist Kevin Borich and Gonna See My Baby Tonight, which punked out at 11. Your Move by Yes, one of the rare breed of prog band who could actually sling together a tune, only got to number 19. Absolutely Right by the Five Man Electrical Band, which came in with a bang this week at number 34, toiled manfully for nine weeks, and only saw a number 16 placement as its reward. Now, if this seems like rough justice, here's the worst of it. The wonderfully funky Jeepster by T-Rex was doomed only to make number 12. The only consolation is that nationally, it fell out at number 27. The thing is, this week's top 10 is pretty solid, and with the exception of number 7, I can't think of a song that doesn't really deserve to be a top 10 hit. Well, number 1 is a bit iffy. Cube Root of 125 this week is one of our mysterious earworms from a band who was the first Scottish group to top the UK charts, The Marmalade and their infectious cousin Norman. Again, it's a song of its time and it sounds for all the world like it could have come off side one of Van Morrison's band in the Street Choir album, Blue Money, Knock Me a Kiss, Call Me Up in Greenland. It's very similar to Blue Money, actually. And of course, the singer isn't a patch on Grumpy Old Van, and the lyrical reference to the stammer is a bit off colour. But you can see why it was a hit, and the tune gets stuck in the old scone. As indicated, number four this week is Day by Day from Godspell by local treasure Colleen Hewitt. Someone once asked me in comments why it was that Colleen Hewitt was held in such high regard despite a relatively meagre return on the charts. Well, there's a few reasons and it also accounts for the goodwill and respect she still generates today. Firstly, there were so few Australian women on the charts back then, there'd only ever been one gold record issued to an Australian woman at that point, that was Liv Mason for Knock Knock Who's There. So Hewitt was no doubt a huge inspiration and she was a multiple threat she made records she did musicals she did the tv route she had great exposure and also much like her contemporary john farnham she was just a good egg and at the time that meant a lot in the industry and that was the image that middle australia wanted to see it helped get farnham out of two sloughs in his career well that and the fact that he is a fantastic singer and it served hewitt in good stead down the years the record is steeped in the typical maximalism and over the toppedness that was the hallmark of producer Ian Meldrum, and it's long, the top 40 single of the time. At three is last week's chart topper, Peace Train, by the unreasonably handsome Cat Stevens. Stevens was massive in Australia from 1970 to 1974. There's an article in Cashbox magazine dated 22674 that says Stevens was presented with an award from the head of Island Records in Australia for achieving 40 gold records. I find that impossible to believe. Now that's two million records to a population of about 13 and a half million people. Whatever, he did have five consecutive top five albums with two number ones and Peace Train from Teaser and the Fire Cat is a pleasant enough little hippie dippy sing along and it topped the charts for a week, deposing the song that is this week's number two. You won't have to wait long to find out what that is because number two Imagine by John Lennon, one of only nine people ever to have possibly been in the actual Beatles themselves. Now, I'm about to be a bit of a dog in the manger here, but I have issues with this song. In fact, a long time ago, I opined to my children, this is the worst song ever written, because even at the height of the Vietnam War and the civil rights struggle, no one, absolutely no one, needed to be lectured by a 30-year-old drug-addled millionaire ensconced in a mansion in deepest mummerset, rich beyond the dreams of avarice, on the joy of having nothing. Try saying imagine no possessions to someone who doesn't actually have any possessions. Try saying imagine no possessions to a man who hoarded and made a fortune off Holstein cows. Steely Dan got the best response in with their song Only a Fool would say that. I'll put it on the playlist, it's far more elegant than I could be. However, as usual, the whole world disagreed with me, and I have to say, on the whole, I'm not a generally disagreeable fellow, I don't think. The good boogers of my town putting this on top of the charts for three weeks, a position it abdicated last week. 
The unredacted facts are stacked. I can't retract or snatch them back. Crack is whack. Hit the road, Jack. Let's counteract what is inexact with Foul's fantastic world of facts. It's Foul's fantastic world of facts. The biggest riser on the charts this week is, as I've already intimated, Colin Hewitt's Day by Day, an unstoppable 14 place rising juggernaut from 18 to 4. It'll be at number 3 next week, and the week after that, it'll become the 199th number one hit we have featured in this series so far. There are but two universal constants, gravity and the fact your record won't be in the top 40 forever. And this week, that proved true for Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs with the surprisingly not ear-splitting The Dawn Song, which was spending the last of its eight weeks on the charts after peaking at number 16. The highest debutante this week is the rollicking Is This The Way To Amarillo for the previously much lauded Tony Christie. ITTWTA got all the way up to number 10 before rollicking its way back off the charts. A remix version of this made number one in the UK in 2005. And the record that longest defied the forces that did for Thorpey this week is the girl from South Yarra, the luminous Olivia Newton-John, her very self, with her first number one hit, The Banks of the Ohio. In the USA, the top hit was Brand New Key by Melanie, a song that I'm pretty confident no radio listener my age will not be aware of. It was everywhere, and sooner rather than later, it'd be at number one. In the UK, it was I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing, no doubt Noel Gallagher of Oasis's favourite song, by the new Seekers, the old Seekers no doubt ensconced in comfortable semi-retirement in leafy Melbourneian suburbs. This time last year, the chart was well and truly topped by I Think I Love You by the Partridge Family, which was, in comments on the Pastors of Foreign Country number 4, generally considered by consensus to be a classic. This time next year, though, the charts will be graced, no, blessed and honoured, to host the mighty Mr. Mark Bolan and T-Rex at number one with Children of the Revolution, which hit the top after we, in 1972, had stopped Metal Guru at number 10, Telegram Sam at 27, and Jeepster at 12. T-Rex never gets old for me. And you'd get short odds about Teaser and the Firecat by Cat Stevens being number one, and if you bet on it, you'd lose your money, because crowbarring a three-week interregnum in that album's 15-week reign at the top was imagined by John Lennon. Oh. Oh, the rest of the album is fine. I quite like Give Me Some Truth and I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, so I've got no problem there. And now it's time for the simian who defies the Darwinian, Monty the Safety Monkey, to drum in this week's number one. Come on, Monty, don't make me want to be calling Gene again. The number one record this week is Desiderata by Les Crane, which isn't as disappointing a reveal as you may think. A lot of people think this piece is some kind of ancient mystic wisdom. That's bunk. It was published in 1927 by a lawyer from Terre Haute, Indiana named Max Ehrman. Les Crane was a radio presenter and talk show host who was married at one time to Tina Louise who played Ginger on Gilligan's Island. Desiderata spent two weeks on top but only ten weeks on the charts all up. That means of the 198 number one records we've covered so far in this series, this record has spent the least amount of time all up in the top 40. Pretty interesting. Well folks, that's how the cow ate the cabbage this week. It was a great week. Great tunes, great stories. All that remains is to let you know that should the good Lord be willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll be back with another instalment in a week or so. Wish.